Hello and welcome everybody to the 47th episode of Comic DNA, on which we will be discussing A Contract with God by Will Eisner. First published in 1978 by Baronet Books, I am Aaron Walther, and with me today is my good buddy and comic reading comrade, Alex Harner. Alex, thanks for coming back to talk about comics with me. As usual, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Good to be here. So we, uh, we will not just be talking about a contract with God. Uh, we, I have, we, we both have the uh, probably relatively recent reprinting of the graphic novel that contains the two sequels that Eisner also made. Uh, he made A Life Force, which was in 1988, and he made Dropsy Avenue, which was in 1995, and they have since been collected into a really nice hardback book and I decided that we would read all of them and talk about them for this episode. I'm going to jump in. Yes. I think A Life Force was 83 initially. Oh, that uh, might be, yeah. Looking at the end, of, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, otherwise 95. They're pretty spread out. Yes. Yeah, about 10 years, uh, yeah. give yeah. or take. But, so, um, I guess the first thing I want to ask you, Alex, uh -huh. is, um, I, and I think I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you this for the sake of the podcast. We, we got a podcast it up here. That's right. <laughs> Was this the first Will Eisner comic you've ever read? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. um, despite hearing his name all the time um, and knowing that he was a you know he's a huge deal with comics, I had never actually read any of his stuff. Um, yeah, I was familiar with the spirit, um, but even that I, to my shame, I had not really read any of other than maybe you know bits and pieces on the internet or whatever here and there. Mm -hmm. So this was the first, uh, these are the first Will Eisner stories I've sat down and, and read in their entirety. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting. Will Eisner is such a, a, a huge a influential figure in comics. Uh, I, I mean, he was there from the beginning. Like, he was making mm -hmm. comics at, at the beginning of the creation of the comic book industry. Um, and then he... he 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 had kind of left comics for a while uh, mm -hmm. it, after he quit the spirit I think in like the early 50s he quit doing the spirit and because a lot of comics were considered lowbrow and the industry was kind of uh, everybody thought the industry was done with I mean the 50s that would have been right you know after the uh, comics code authority had been set into right. place and then everything kind of got revitalized. We all know the story, the history of Marvel Comics and so on and so forth. So then Eisner decided to come back to comics in the 70s. But uh -huh. he really wanted to come back and uh, make uh, highbrow art, uh, you could essentially say. He really wanted to create literature with comics and not just uh, the the low art style that was a lot of the serialized comic books that were being printed monthly, right? And uh, you could, I mean, I I I don't I haven't done enough research, but I think it's uh, commonly understood that a contract with God is the first graphic novel to be published. It gets that credit. It seems like yes. Um, I I feel like I've read here and there that there was other stuff that happened before then, but maybe right. wasn't as well known or as clearly, uh, didn't have as clear an intention. Yes. Um, yes. Whereas he was, he was, he was definitely going for a, you know, a self-contained comics as literature sort of approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, if there's, if there's other guys out there, I'm off the top of my head, I don't know, you know, what the very official first graphic novel might have been, but right. I, I think often this gets credit. Well, and this certainly is, if it's not the first, it's certainly one of the first, and it's certainly one of the most important, not just because of its, not just because of being first, but also because it's by Will Eisner, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he is really, really a true talent. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I mean, Will Eisner, he created a lot of the like modern forms of uh, comic storytelling that we all like understand as being common in comics. Will Eisner pioneered a lot of that, and there's there's a reason that the Eisners, which is the annual award handed out for uh, by the comic book industry 
is named after him, the Eisners. He's right. He, right. He's the guy. He's the guy. He's he's the one. Will Eisner. So yeah, but I do think it's interesting. Like as we were saying, the like his his place in the comic book industry and his influence on creators. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, so many people will reference Will Eisner. Like you know. People that are in the comic book industry, like real comic book people, everybody knows Will Eisner, as they should. <laughs> but I think comic fans, like people who, um, I this is where it gets a little tricky because I don't want to just say comic fans, but right, maybe right. it's pretty broad. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty broad. But maybe I should say your standard uh, superhero comic fans mm -hmm. who still make up a a large, large portion of the readership. Uh, I, I haven't looked at any numbers, but I, I'm not uncomfortable saying it's probably the majority. Certainly, that's buying like a recur, like a recurring market. The superhero comic market is still large, if not mm -hmm. dwindling. But um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Really, what I'm getting at is, I just find it really interesting that a lot of people who come into comics from you know reading Marvel or DC comics, they're really not familiar with Will Eisner at all. And you're gonna it have is, obviously yeah, it's funny. Ahead. No, I, I I totally agree with you. It's and I I could count myself amongst that number, mm -hmm. um, despite hearing his name all the time. Uh, for whatever reason, it seems like there's. Maybe maybe because his stuff isn't immediately associated with Marvel or DC, maybe that's part of it. Well, that is part of um, it. Yeah, like it's not as widely published or available uh, well, or of, referenced as readily. Yeah, um, Will Eisner, the, his big superhero comic was The Spirit. And one of the things that Eisner was big on was uh, creator control. Mm -hmm. And he, he, as far as I know, he really maintained creative control over The Spirit. Like he didn't like he didn't want to happen to him what happened to um the C Siegel and Schuster with Superman. He didn't uh -huh. sell he didn't like sell it to super to DC or or whatnot. And so okay. as a result, I don't think that the spirit was as um proliferated. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, in Yeah, that makes sense. In comics. And and since he stopped it in the fifties, it wasn't really it was it was just considered an old golden age character. Like it wasn't a character that went through the silver age and into right. the bronze age. It wasn't a part of the big Marvel revolution. It really right. was sort of like the superhero character that really was from the old before time of comics. Right. And there was nobody that could do anything new with it because it wasn't like DC just had the character lying around that they could put a new creative team on. Right. That's really interesting. I yeah. had not, like, that sort of, I forget that comics were, like, in a bad way in the late 50s. Oh, and yes. Marvel really did recharge everything, and the spirit wasn't a part of that, because it, it wasn't connected to the big publishers. Right. That's really interesting. And I think that is why, among a lot of these fans, a lot of, um, like, comic fans that come to comics through Marvel and DC, you're going to find legions of people who are all humongous fans in supporting uh, Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. And Jack Kirby kind of becomes the face of, like, the grandfather of comics. Mm -hmm. And Jack Kirby, uh, I, I mean, I am a huge fan of Jack Kirby, and, the you know, the work he did in comics is undeniable. But, uh, you know, uh, Will Eisner did uh, just as much, you could say, Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe even more so. They they both led very different lives, um, like in the, throughout their careers, and uh, I think an argument could be made. I don't think I'm out of line in saying this, but I think that Will Eisner was a much, much better artist than Jack Kirby. Hmm. Now, Jack Kirby's imagination is just through the roof. Like stylistically, I love Jack Kirby. Like I can right. I, flaws and all, but uh -huh. I mean he. You know, Jack Kirk, like, there's there's an attention to, like, anatomy and just general uh, consistency with Eisner's work hmm. that yeah. I, that gets lost in a lot of Kirby's work. And part right. of that is because Kirby was working in the machine. He was right. cranking out, you know, paid multiple pages in a day and just... You know, that's that's what he had to do. That's That was how he made comics. And that's what... 
right. went into why his books look the way they look and why his style is his style. Whereas right. Eisner was much more, as I understand it, was much more uh, focused on attention to detail and mm -hmm. uh, the overall complete uh, product. Mm -hmm. Well, just looking at these three stories that we just read, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like he artistically in terms of you know how he's arranging his, arranging his pages how he's drawing his characters like he, he seems like he um he's experimenting more or uh, he was old when he did these so yeah. maybe experimenting is the wrong word but i i can see how his work maybe he it looks like he's pushing himself a little harder as an artist to try to kind of push the medium um whereas i mean kirby again kirby's incredible i'm not not down on Kirby at all. Right, but right. Like you said, he he worked within a very you know his style became very set, and mm -hmm. um, that's not to say he didn't do amazing things, but um, it, it kind of became the Kirby brand. I feel like Eisner maybe experiments or just yeah, I, experiments is the wrong word, but he he, he pushes he, it a little. Yeah, more. he pushed he pushed the limits on like what you could do uh, with storytelling and comics, uh, mm -hmm. comic sequential storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really good book uh, called The Comic Book History of Comics and it's by Fred Van Lent and Ryan uh, Dunlavey okay. uh, Fred Van Lent he's he's a pretty prominent writer Like he's written some stuff for Marvel um, he's a series of books uh, these two it's it was a, a series a comic series and it's been collected into a nice, really, really nice graphic novel I really love this book Comic Book History of Comics it's just sort of just like a collection of the oral history of the comic book industry and all the people that were involved in the uh, creation okay. of it and the direction of it. And it just kind of goes over a lot of these creators' lives, where they came from and what they did in the comic book industry. So, like, a lot of time is spent talking about Will Eisner. So you get a lot of information about Will Eisner in this book. And a lot of time talking about Jack Kirby and, uh, you know, all... All kinds of people. Anyway, that's sort of just a little diversion. I just think that it's a really good book if you really are <laughs> interested in the history of who these uh, who these creators were and uh, like what what they were doing with comics. Because mm -hmm. uh, comics is an interesting industry. It's an interesting medium because it's it really is a product of 20th century pop culture. And it's right. only been around for like a hundred years, you know. Right. It's fascinating. Yeah, twentieth century pop culture and the means by which uh, story, like the 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 means by which things were mass produced mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, what they had to work with and the deadlines they had, like the comics are all very tied to all of that. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I read that book. That's, I, I recommend it. It's it's a good book. But maybe we'll do a podcast on that book someday. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about this Will Eisner book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right on. We'll segue. We'll segue from that uh, mention of uh, pop culture, twentieth century pop culture, and the means of the industry, into kind of what this book is about, which is about people, and it's set in specific times in twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Uh. So, um, oh, one thing, I guess I forgot to mention I was going to say, I, I have read some of Will Eisner's The Spirit, and they're amazing comics. <laughs> they're really, really good. Hmm. Um, but I guess that's not really important, but I might, I might have that <laughs> well, I, I definitely need to read more I, Eisner. I would, I would recommend it. So anyway, uh, let, let's just talk about, we'll talk about A Contract with God first, because that's the first one. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, Alex, as as an artist and a comic book reader, uh, and as somebody who is aware of the importance of Will Eisner, but who had never read a Will Eisner book, what was mm -hmm. just your first impression upon reading this? My first impression of specifically with a contract, contract with, God. with God. Yes. Um, I liked it, but I sort of felt like it was kind of. Um, this is a first impression, mind you. Of course. Of course. Um, I kind of felt like it was probably a really big deal when it was published, but maybe coming from 
from nowadays and having uh, read many other types of comics and having you know many other types of comics having been produced since when this was made um, I think it didn't impress me as much as I thought it would does that make sense yes it does I actually had a very similar reaction okay I uh, I, I liked it of course mm-hmm. um, but yeah it I don't I don't want to like talk about it in dismissive terms but mm-hmm. it didn't it wasn't quite as profound as I was expecting it to be, mm-hmm. perhaps you could say. Right, right. Um, of course, of course, it, I really like the composition of the pages. I really re- like Eisner's style. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot we could talk about just in the art and the way the, the book is laid out, which I think that is pretty important and pretty groundbreaking mm-hmm. when you, when we like talk about his. Uh, use or lack of panel borders and mm-hmm. how the pages are all kind of open and yeah. and the way that uh, all the lettering is integrated into the art it wasn't done separately this mm-hmm. this is how the pages looked in their final form he did everything mm-hmm. yeah so in that respect I think it's it is uh, still uh, it's a groundbreaking book but um, as to the actual story itself, uh, mm-hmm. About the uh, the Jewish guy that makes the contract with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was okay, but it didn't seem like it felt like somebody was like attempting like to really kind of like touch on something that was kind of deep, but didn't. I it just didn't really grab me. Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> it, it a lot of thoughts come to mind. Uh, um, but I, I agree with you. It. I mean, I think if I was reading comics in the seventies, and my the only other books I was reading were, I don't know, X Men and right, Batman or something. This this would have been like really fascinating, right? Um, and it, it's 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 still fascinating, but like you said, it, it doesn't feel uh, as profound as I mean some of the other comics we've talked about on your, your podcast. I was, um, I was going to say, it, it's, it's almost a situation where maybe we've been, I was been spoiled by reading something like Asterius Polyp first. Right. You know, because right. Asterius Polyp is a book that could not exist without a contract with God. Right, absolutely. You know? Yeah, and, so it's kind, of, it's kind of unfair to... Right. Like, to come at it from that angle, but we mm-hmm. can't help but come at it from that angle. <laughs> exactly. Now, now talking about a contract with God, it's actually split up into four different stories. Right. I did actually like the later stories more than the first one. I cuz like mm. when when I'm talking like what I was just saying now about it feeling not quite as profound as I was expecting, I technically mm-hmm. I, I really was just referring to the first story. Okay. I think my attitude toward the the remaining two, so like the first one was the uh the Jewish rabbi who got mad at God. And then the second one was about like the guy that was singing in the streets. Right. Remember that one? The street singer. Yeah. And then the, there's the third one about the super, like the. Right. And then the fourth one was all the different people going on vacation out on like the country place. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, I I think I still basically feel the same way. It really wasn't all that profound per se, but mm-hmm. I do think that the story. By the time we got to the fourth story, which was all the different mm-hmm. characters on the farm. I do feel like the storytelling started to feel a little bit more, um, maybe not complex, but mm-hmm. there just uh, felt like there was more to it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you had multiple characters all kind of integrating with each other. I, I was a little more engaged with, like, a story. Yeah. Whereas the, the first three were all very singular. It was just sort of mm-hmm. following one guy around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think his stuff starts to really get uh, exciting and interesting and surprising when he starts playing all of these characters uh, alongside each other, mm. and you start seeing their lives overlap, and you start um, it starts to feel like he's he's telling the story um, not just of like a singular person, like uh, a contract of God mm. tells the story of, but uh, of. Uh, of the city, of his neighborhood, of kind of a, a specific um, point in time, 
and he's kind of telling you about the world that he knew, which I, I really enjoyed that side of it. Um, Me too. I enjoyed the sort of historical aspect of it. I enjoyed learning about New York, um, learning about the sort of history of all of these immigrant neighborhoods. Um, like, as that stuff gets laid in there, it starts to get really compelling, I thought. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree. I do, I do also think, uh, like we were kind of talking about um, how Eisner pushes like the limits of what a comic can do, mm -hmm. and I do think that there was some ambitious storytelling going on. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, like it's like it. There's like some. I, I I'm trying to think of how to put this. I don't want to just say like dark stuff in the stories. But there's mm -hmm. a very uh, what I what I really like about it is that there's a very um, you could almost say maybe this is just me bringing my own perception to it. There's almost this very like uh, existential attitude where this story is just these are things that are happening, and it doesn't really feel that there's a strong uh, like authorial voice telling you how to feel about it. Mm -hmm. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I, I think the the only one where I felt like I was supposed to maybe be wrestling with the uh, if there was some sort of um, kind of didactic purpose to it was was a contract with God. Yes, like where it felt like he was he was trying to make a specific point. Mm -hmm. um, but then once once he kind of starts telling these other shorter stories and then the other the other two big stories of Life Force and Dropsy Avenue, mm -hmm. I agree with you. It's almost like he's he's kind of just saying this is kind of a, a snapshot of the world that I knew and it's what it is. Yeah, and and I think that I mean I had certainly enjoyed 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 the comics more when they got into that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and and like I guess it also just kind of allows like it allows these characters to play out and feel natural and feel real, even though they're in these like weird or sometimes dark situations, which are also really nice. I guess I guess it's not nice, but also um, it just makes it for an interesting reading experience because it's not. It's not the sort of thing that you normally expect to see in a comic. Is depending on what kind of comics you read, I guess is what I'm getting at. Like, okay. so we were talking about like if we had, if you had read this in 1978, and really the only comics you had read was you know like Marvel or DC comics, and maybe mm -hmm. maybe you know you would have read some like Robert Crumb or something if you were like into that you know the real underground comics. This mm -hmm. still stands out as being different from all of that. I mean, hmm. like, you have the story in A Contract with God about the super, who's kind of a sleazy jerk. <laughs> and Right. And then, like, you know, like, the tenants are yelling at him, and he's kind of eyeballing the the lady's underage daughter who was taking a shower. Uh -huh. And then she comes down to his, to his room and, like, lets him uh, look under her dress, you know, for money. Right. Like there's just like all this implied like pedophilia stuff going on, right? And then yeah. and then she kills. Pretty dark. Yeah, it's dark. <laughs> and then she kills his dog. Like she poisons the dog, and right. it just gets darker. It just <laughs> keeps getting like, darker. Wow. And then and then he go like chases after her, but he can't do anything to her because it's just everybody sees him beating up a kid, right. and so they're gonna call the cops on him. And then he the cops show up because you know because you know it's it's this weird situation where. There's not a clear hero and a not a clear victim. And that right. is something that you are not used to seeing in a lot of traditional comics that are rooted in uh, superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, that's, that is what really makes it stand out. But on the flip side, nor is it... Uh, it's not trashy the way a lot of underground comics are. And I love R. Crom. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> trying to say, like... I'm not. I'm not casting any like moral uh, authority on that. I'm just saying that there's there's a definite difference to this kind of a story, the way Eisner tells it, versus you you know you could pick up 
the those old underground like you could pick up an arc rom comic and see plenty of stuff about sex and mm-hmm. and you know pedophilia and all kinds of crap but it's presented in a very different way right yeah yeah not that i i know not that i've read a lot of chrome but um all of these stories even when they i mean i think the super's probably the darkest although there's still some dark moments in the others um I still feel like he's trying to kind of tell a, a, a kind of just a humanistic mm-hmm. history of things that were happening around him. Like it doesn't feel like he's trying to like use the medium to challenge your thoughts about sex or it sounds like it feels like he's just trying to show people. Yes, yes. Um, at least that was my my feeling. Oh, absolutely. I think the focus on. on it, on all of these books, maybe not so much. Well, no, absolutely. On all in all three of the books that we're talking about here, the focus really is just on uh, sh- giving you a a perception, like an accurate, realistic world filled with different types of people, mm-hmm. and just how they interact. Mm-hmm. And I think he does a really good job of that. By and large, yeah. Yeah. I found it interesting. Is it okay if I, I start to talk about some of the other the other two big stories, not just the shorts within a contract with God? Um yeah, I was gonna say do you want to move on to a life force? Uh yeah, I, well I would guess I was just gonna kinda speak about them broadly, but then, Oh yeah, sure, no, that's fine. More, go ahead, go more ahead. Specific. Um and what was I gonna say? I was gonna <laughs> say <laughs> uh with as his stories get more complex and he shows more characters interacting with each other um, often it's a lot of quick snapshots mm-hmm. which I found a little <laughs> there were points where I thought it was a little bit um, jarring because he would you know he'd have something happen that was like you know immigrant moves to neighborhood okay and then he'd have uh, something else happen and then suddenly you'd have something traumatic or terrible happen. Um, and then you'd cut to the next scene. Like, it was really just like all of these little vignettes that start to layer up versus, um, I don't know, following following one group of characters for 120 pages or something. Um, I don't know where I'm going with yeah, that. Yeah, that, uh, that actually is something I was going to talk about. Um, that's... Uh, stylistically, so each each of the three books in this, uh, you have a contract with God, a life force, and Dropsy Avenue. And I, I when I read them all, when I read them all in a row, I can sort of see an evolution of storytelling style. Mm-hmm. And I think that Eisner was going for something very specific in each one. Mm-hmm. So the first book was really, uh, you could call it like a proto graphic novel. Because okay. it was four separate, unconnected stories, just sort mm-hmm. of about characters from the same area, Dropsy Avenue, mm-hmm. is where all these stories take place, which is just a neighborhood in New York. Mm-hmm. And, or, a, a, is it actually supposed to be more like a borough, I think? No, 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 no that's not right. It's, it's a neighborhood. Neighborhood, a couple of blocks. A couple of blocks, I... something like that. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a big I city should... metropolitan guy, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. <laughs> I should know my urbanist terms better. And the point is, it's a, it's a couple of you know yeah. connected apartment buildings that right. sort of overlap with each other. And so the first book, A Contract with God, like I said, it's it's really just four short stories, unconnected but printed together. And then the second book, A Life Force, really to me that's I mean it was published you know years late, well a few years later. I don't know how much later. We've already, we've contested the the publication date, but um, <laughs> the second book, A Life Force, is a much more complete version of what he was trying to do in a contract with God. I would say it's got I think that's right. it's got a a set beginning and end. It follows it it ha- does have a wide cast of characters, but it does follow uh, a core cast. Right. Of what it's yeah. about, and they are right. and they are all connected to each other, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's 
it does a uh, like it does a really good job of kind of like floating in and out of these characters' lives and how their lives are affecting the other characters' lives and vice versa and how it's all this mm-hmm. big complex connected network and that's what makes up this uh, area, this Dropsy Avenue. Mm-hmm. And um, he does it really well. And then the third story, Dropsy Avenue, is taking it a step further. And it's no longer just about a story about a couple of people in this set time. It mm-hmm. really is about Dropsy Avenue in, in its entirety throughout mm-hmm. a 100-year history. So it starts Mm -hmm. at the beginning in 1870, at the beginning of the the creation of Dropsy Avenue, and then it ends in 1970, where uh, it's not just completely spoil the story, but it's like it's finished, and then there's a there's like a restarting, which is thematically kind of what it's about, the cycles. Mm -hmm. And so yes. As you were saying, the storytelling, particularly in Dropsy Avenue, more so than in any of the others, it's very... Um, I, you know what? I read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, and I don't remember the term that he used for this. I'm a very <laughs> bad... Damn. I'm a very bad comic book creator. But um, <laughs> he... Uh, there's, there's not a lot of, like, scene-to-scene continuity... It'll be just mm-hmm. like you drop in on a scene, and he'll do that for a page, and then you mm-hmm. move forward in time like a tremendous amount, right. because right. it's a hundred years of history compressed into like a hundred pages or however long it is, you know. Right. And that's one of the like miracles, not miracles, but that's one of the things like stylistically that you can do with comics, and you can do really well, is right. the compression of time. Right. And I thought, oh, go ahead. I thought that was very interesting, or, or I feel like that that is very apparent in, especially in Dropsy Avenue. Mm. Um, like when when I started reading that one, um, I was reading it at breakfast, and it starts out in 1870, t- talking about these Dutch farmers, and it uh, in like three pages, uh, this drunken uncle goes out to set fire to his neighbor's field and his niece is with him and he accidentally sets her on fire and she dies which is like horrific mm. and then her father shoots the drunk uncle and then you turn the page and it's like okay and on to the next thing exactly uh, and I was like that's like that is really heavy and intense and like it just kind of came out of nowhere and then I, I guess initially I was like how do I feel about that as a as the development of this story? But it's very it's using the fact that it's a comic book really well. Mm-hmm. It's it's setting up this quick sequence of panels that gives you this sort of like long before Dropsy Avenue was Dropsy Avenue, there was this like mm-hmm. kind of dark conflict that that started things moving, um, and then you you skip you skip to the next thing, you skip to the next thing, mm-hmm. kind of hop around. Um, and you're you're hopping from conflict to conflict. It's all mm-hmm. these like just like key important moments that lead to the shifting and the cycle of change on Dropsy Avenue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Which and that's sort of like the theme of the the third story, Dropsy. That's the like the ongoing theme is just this cycle of human life and mm-hmm. how. Uh, you know, people come and people go, and in, in many ways, I mean, the, the, really, like the story itself is a lot about the racial tensions, or yeah, yeah, you could say racial tensions, ethnic tensions. I think so. Yeah. Just between, and this is something that obviously is really not unique to New York, but a, like a, a storied history of New York because you have so many people moving in there from all over the place. So you have mm-hmm. all these different uh, groups of people that are being forced to uh, integrate with each other for, in many ways, for the first time in human history. I mean, that was the whole point, like, with European countries, is that, you know, you had the Spains in Spain and the Italians in Italy, and they would occasionally, different countries are going to war with each other all the time, fighting over land. In America, it was, they no longer have their country allegiance. It's just all these people, but they still have their ethnic uh, 
their cultural differences, and they still right. don't necessarily want to deal with other cultures. Right. Yeah, that that friction is like present. Exactly, and that's I think every little vignette. That's uh, absolutely that's the, that's the, that's obviously the point that he's driving home is this this friction between differences of people, mm-hmm. and how that is just constantly driving the 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 cycles of people moving in and out of the neighborhood and uh, i did think it was very i thought i i I really liked the ending to dropsy avenue i thought i thought that little epilogue was really nice how like essentially after a hundred years of decay the the whole area was bought out and rebuilt into a nice neighborhood Mm -hmm. and it was (laughs) I, it was just really this these last couple of pages of these two neighbors. You have a white guy who, mm-hmm. probably not intentionally so, but he kind of looks like Adolf Hitler with blonde hair. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and his, Maybe not. It's hard to say. Hard to say if hard it's intentional, but he's got the, the haircut and kind of a little wimpy mustache. <laughs> I don't think that was the intention. It's just initially what I thought of. But his okay. his neighbor is clearly a black guy. Mm-hmm. And they're both complaining about the foreigners that are moving into the neighborhood and how their foreigners are going to ruin it. And mm-hmm. it's just sort of, I, I thought it was a nice look at how, um, you know, that was that was the running theme, the problem throughout the whole story is that one group is there and another group moves in and the first group starts complaining about it and then there's all this <coughs> tension. But... Right. One of the other themes of it was integration. There's all, mm-hmm. all this talk of interfaith marriage, of mm-hmm. you know different people teaming up with different groups for business reasons, and so it's I don't know. It's this idea at the end you have integration. You have a white guy and a black guy who seem to be perfectly uh, you know happy neighbors with each other. They're they're friends and they both are. Both find a new, yeah. A new group of people to be unhappy about. (laughs) Exactly, and they both have a group of people that they're unhappy about. Together, they're unified over their distrust of foreigners. Right, and they both talk about retiring to Florida. Exactly. Get away from it all. Get away from it all. (laughs) That was pretty funny. And there was just this sort of very, um, I I don't know how to, I don't know what to call it. Like, again, that's kind of what, what goes into this. Like it was almost a punchline. It was like a nice punchline to the story. Like it was. It, I think it was supposed to be a little humorous, uh, mm-hmm. but also poignant. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I. I thought so. Yeah. I. Uh, I liked it. I. I did like that. I would say. Did you? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Did you? Um, did you prefer? Dropsy Avenue to the other two, a contract with God and a life force. I was actually just going to bring that up. Yeah, I would okay. say that uh, Life Force is my favorite of the three. Okay. I think it's his. I think it's his most complex. I mm-hmm. think. I think it was. Um, it it had. It it, it spent out of all the stories, it spent the most time with its characters, and so mm-hmm. you really got to be invested in their story and. Mm-hmm. Um, and their lives and what was going on yeah. but I also yeah. did appreciate the there was still like it still dealt with the same themes as both of the other stories because you had the main character Jacob the old Jewish guy who mm-hmm. was wrestling with his faith and this this idea of you know like what what is God doing this to him that's right. like a, really his his purpose overall. Exactly, he's dealing with no, this. Ex, he, What's the point? Yeah, he's dealing with this existential crisis of like the the theme is that he he uh, refers to himself as a cockroach, and that's the theme of the story is that mankind is no different than cockroaches. And yes, see, there's there's lots of like, how am I any different than this cockroach? You know what mm-hmm. what what purpose do I have? Why is what is the meaning of life? This you know, real you know big heavy stuff. <laughs> and um, but you also have all of the talk of uh, like human interaction and integration and fear of other people in the story about the other characters. So you have Jacob's daughter, and mm-hmm. then the other the other guy. Um, I can't think of his name, 
the you know the white guy who wants to marry her. Right, right. He's kind of the. Um, he was wealthy, and then he lost his money in the Great Depression, yes. and was pulling himself back together. Right, he was rebuilding his life. Forget this too. Yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. so there's there's still a lot of themes of like uh, cultural integration, religious integration, um, starting over. Because there's <laughs> like there's there's a line where uh, Jacob is complaining about how because his his son also married uh, a non-Jewish person, and right, right. His, his mother won't won't like the uh, Jacob's wife, the, his son's mother. She will not accept that their son is marrying outside of the faith and she won't even like mm -hmm. have the woman in her house and that's obviously a huge mm -hmm. source of tension for the family and there's that part where Jacob finds out that his daughter now wants to marry somebody who's not Jewish right. and he talks about how it's like the end of his lineage like it's like the end of tradition mm -hmm. and it's interesting because he's talking about this to a woman who escaped the Nazis that he brought over to America and so it's it's this whole situation of like the Jewish tradition being ended is framed against the World War II and like the terrible actual Holocaust going on in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's I don't know, it's I I think that a life force definitely is like the most complex of the three. I think it's really deep. And mm -hmm. I think that the characters are very engaging. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, like, you really start to, like, feel for them. Yeah. I think I think that one more than the others, I felt more personally invested in the characters. Yes. Like, I, I, was, I, I started to really hope, like, I hope this works out. Yeah, exactly. I hope they find the solution. Whereas I, you know, Drops the Avenue being more about the neighborhood, which I, I thought was really fascinating, especially historically. Right. Um, it just moved so quickly mm -hmm. that it's like... Oh, I, that girl was just burned to death. That's terrible. But right. I never really—you don't know who the character is. Invested in the character right. too. I mean, she barely. Yeah. She has like two lines of dialogue. You know, she's right. She, in many ways, right. she's just a prop. I, maybe that's not fair, but well, like, well, it's okay. it's it's about the bigger picture. Exactly. And I was the I was gonna say it's the macro storytelling of Dropsy right. Avenue, which I appreciate. Right. Like, I I do like it, uh, mm -hmm. and I've I. It's it's a kind of thing that as a creator I actually think about stuff trying like wanting to do something like that a lot, mm -hmm. like the like telling the larger story like not just like it's it's right. it's very easy to tell a story about like a person and the troubles they're dealing with in their lives, but to really mm -hmm. tell like a, a large story about to take to take a look at the human condition not through the lens of a person but through the lens of a hundred years of multiple people is challenging. It's it's difficult. Yeah. yeah. It seems like uh, I mean, I, many artists try and do it in many ways. Mm. I feel like every few years a movie comes out that is, uh, it's a series of of shorts and about people's overlapping lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some of them work really well, and some of them don't. But it seems like it is something that uh, we see a lot. We we see people trying to do that, like to to tell a story that's more than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. um, about about people. Um, which is interesting. It's interesting how uh, this is a cool collection of stories and I don't know how many other graphic novels uh, Eisner wrote, but it, it goes from kind of a very the first story of Contract with God is very much about most of the stories are about individuals and then we get this sort of uh, in A Life Force, a story about Jacob the individual in the context of his community and getting to know his community. So we're sort of broadening the scope. Mm -hmm. And then by Drops the Avenue, the, we're, you know, the scope is really wide, yeah. and we're not talking about individuals or an individual anymore. Right. Um, it's a bigger... Yeah, that's bigger that's what I was thing. saying earlier that I find kind of fascinating about like reading all three of them as as a mm -hmm. whole like actually they work really well together and like you mm -hmm. said it's it's neat how it really just keeps scaling up like the further mm -hmm. into the book you go the wider the story becomes mm -hmm. and i i think i mean from a storytelling aspect that's really interesting but even from like a comic just a creator aspect <coughs> excuse me even from just a creator aspect 
I can see him kind of evolving in like how he wants to tell these stories and what he wants to do. And I, Absolutely. and that kind of goes with what we we're saying about him pushing the limits of like what comic storytelling can be. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. just keep telling little short vignettes about people. And it, it, it does by you, by the time you get to Dropsy Avenue, it, it evolves beyond just here's some short stories about characters on Dropsy Avenue to, it's a whole bunch of short stories about characters on Dropsy Avenue, but it's all integrated into a single narrative and a purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a good. It's a good collection of stories. It is. It's, yeah. Uh, um, despite saying that I wasn't as impressed as I thought I would be with the first one, right? Contract with God. It, when you get through all of them, I come away feeling much more impressed by the. You know Eisner's. Uh, <laughs> how did he put it in the intro? His uh, his body of work. Yeah. Like it's a good it's a good slice of what he was trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. and you kind of see it all, um, which is really cool. Yeah, I agree. It was the same thing with me. Like we, we were talking earlier. First, you know, when I'm first talking about this, I'm talking about how you know I wasn't too drawn into it, and you know it was kind of quaint, which is like the most backhanded compliment you could give somebody. <laughs> But it's quaint. it's quaint, you know. <laughs> but like that—that that really, like, like I, I was really stressing to earlier to say that really was how I just my initial thoughts on just like the first story. And by the time I actually got through it, I was I'm I'm actually really awed by just the skill and the complexity of the storytelling. Like I just as a trilogy, I think it's fantastic. Like the whole book is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of processing the, processing this as we're talking about right, it, and right. I'm I'm liking it more as I think about how they all connect mm -hmm. to each other. That's why I like to do these podcasts. I think that when you talk about a book, you sort of like force yourself to understand it, or you allow yourself to think about it in ways that you wouldn't. I think it's very easy to just read something and put it down and not really think about mm -hmm. it, and then. I don't know. Have you ever? I, I, I've had that happen to me a few times where I've read something and not really thought about it, and then I've had somebody say like, "Oh, have you read this?" And I say, "Yeah," and they start talking about it, and I'm like, "I don't. Oh. What? I don't even remember like it being like that." And then you kind of go back and like, "Wow, yeah. I wasn't even paying attention as I read this. How did I read this?" Right. So, yes, that's why, uh, why I like talking about. Yeah. That. There's definitely power uh, to to putting. Uh, to taking your thoughts and, and making them into words <laughs> and attempting to uh, uh, explain them coherently to someone else. Right, right. I'm just like, you, you end up surprising yourself. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> ah, dang. Yeah. But yeah, so I I really, really liked this book. I think that it's, it's a good example of why Will Eisner is freaking Will Eisner, why he is mm. the grandfather or the father of comics, graphic novels, <laughs> certainly. Um, and there's it's very clear to me why so many creators list him as a primary influence because that's mm -hmm. I mean he's he's the guy that did all this totally yes. yeah yeah <laughs> now, he Eisner has made um a, a good number of other graphic novels so I'm definitely definitely going yeah. to. <laughs> Look into those. Now I feel yeah. like it's it's my duty it, to get out there and find. That it really stuff. is. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Now I have a bit of a framework to work from, mm -hmm. having read these three, mm -hmm. and I can have a way to a, to to sort of a lens to look at other stuff. Right. With, so to speak. We we'll have to. I have to get some spirit comics and talk about those on the podcast. Yeah, I, be fun. I have some collections, some old spirit reprints that were done in the 70s. A friend of mine worked at like, um, not a Goodwill, but something like a Goodwill, like a, like not a, not mm -hmm. a Salvation Army, but like some kind of like mission where, you know, people just turn in old stuff yeah. and then they sell it, yeah. sell it for really cheap. And somebody turned in mm -hmm. all these old comics. And in that mm -hmm. collection were these old, um, I think it was by Kitchen Sink, that was the publisher, and they would okay. reprint all these, they would they were reprinting the spirit in the 70s. And so I got okay. a handful of those, and they are just awesome. Like, they're really cool. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's a damn shame that they made a spirit movie 
that apparently was... <sighs> I don't want to talk about it. I saw it. I don't want to <laughs> talk about it, okay? <laughs> I'm not an expert on the spirit. Like, I'm not an expert on Will Eisner. You know, this... I've, re- I've read some of those spirit comics, and this was the first of his graphic novels that I've read. But uh, mm. there was... I think the, the thing with that spirit movie... And this was really hard to talk about with that movie without talking about Frank Miller in addition. <laughs> right, right. Because uh, he definitely... It, Frank Miller obviously is influenced and inspired by Will Eisner. And as I understand mm-hmm. it, they, they had communicated. I don't know if they were friends, but they certainly were like uh, professionals who communicated with each other. And so... Mm-hmm. I, I remember seeing a thing where he's after Will Eisner died, Frank Miller felt a personal responsibility to make this movie because he was the only one who could do it justice. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, that whole movie is just like a weird distortion. It's yeah. it's a thing where you can clearly see where he's trying to or where he thinks he's drawing from the spirit. Like it's okay. like it's it's like a it's like looking in a carnival funhouse mirror. <laughs> like it's like all sort of there, but it just yeah. tonally doesn't work. It's, a, it's yeah. the same thing with that Judge Dredd movie with Sylvester Stallone. Okay. No, no, nearly everything in that movie was taken straight out of the comics, and it's mm-hmm. awful. Like it's like it just doesn't quite it doesn't click. click. They're trying to be true to the comics, but it's in a weird tone deaf way. Whereas mm-hmm. the new movie Dredd, starring Carl Urban. Took, <laughs> took some liberties. You know, they weren't trying to be straight from the comic, certainly with the costume designs. You know, they streamlined some stuff. And they made one of the greatest action movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty badass it's, movie. It's great. I agree. Uh, I agree. So I think that's kind of the situation with that Spirit movie. It feels <laughs> like... It, it's obviously made by somebody who knows a lot about the Spirit. Like, like Frank right. Miller obviously knows a lot about the Spirit the character in the comics... Yeah, but it does doesn't work. Not in the way yeah. he does it. Well, I, mean, I I totally believe that Frank Miller was um, genuine in his his desire to. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, yeah. I think he he loved Will Eisner's work and drew from absolutely. it. Absolutely. But uh, I <laughs> I haven't seen the movie. All I know is that um, my feeling is <laughs> my sense is that it didn't do a lot of favors to Will Eisner's legacy. No. Uh, in terms of endearing tried, the fans. It, or... I mean, my my biggest, the easiest criticism I would make is that it tried to do, uh, it, it, there was too much uh, Sin City stylistic stuff in it. And Will mm-hmm. Eisner's art is just way more... Uh, uh, <laughs> just better. <laughs> it's just it's just better. Like, it's, it's more competent. Eisner, Eisner's art is so polished and although he does do like like the spirit does have like noir aspects to it you know it's you know he's a guy wearing a trench coat and he's a ground level superhero he's got no powers he's just beating up thugs you know <laughs> it's you can easily you know fit that into the frame of like film noir stuff but like it it just didn't like I, Will Eisner's better than that like Will, Will Eisner's work <laughs> is better than than Frank Miller's two tone Mo, you know, monotone, uh, flat imaging. I just, I don't know. That's you know that Sin City movie is pretty dated at this point. I don't think it was it was neat at the time, but I don't think anybody really still holds it up as much of anything. Uh, yeah, I wonder. What was that <laughs> Sin City and Three Hundred came out? Uh, you know, they were a big deal for they were. a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Anyway, hey, we, we, we don't have to yeah, we really kind of like straight off topic there. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody that tuned in to listen to us talk about some graphic novel that most people have never read really, <laughs> really love this discussion about Frank Miller. <laughs> but it's all tangently related. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One comment led to That's another. Right. This is a thread. You Natural conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we 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 do here on Comic DNA. It, it is. I've said it before. I, it's it's just a conversation. Uh, it's just a hangout, you know. Yeah. I yeah. like hanging out and talking about comics. Me too. It's awesome. It's good yeah. stuff. So, uh, <laughs> as about the the specific book that we're talking about on this podcast, um, mm-hmm. do well. Actually, you know, there is one other thing I wanted to ask you. We'll kind of 
do okay. get into one last thing before we wrap up the episode. Um, okay. What do you think about Will Eisner's art? I've I've been kind of talking a lot about not a lot, but you know I've I've been talking about his art, but I haven't really heard you say much of anything about his um, him as an artist. We've talked about his story, mm -hmm. but not the art. So I want mm -hmm. your perspective on that. Um, yeah, good question. I like it. Uh, gosh, I don't even know. I think, like you mentioned before. St the stuff that he does with kind of how he frames his pages, how he has pages with a lot of white space why the, where there aren't necessarily borders and things kind of flow together, mm -hmm. um, or where the, where the um, text and lettering are integrated or where he'll have, you know, some prose or historical bit uh, that's kind of written out next to images, mm -hmm. and it kind of flips between that and more traditional panels here and there. Um it's really cool, and I can see how, like, I would think definitely when these first came out, like, probably, and he was really pushing things. He was, he was challenging himself, um, challenging the medium to, to do things differently. So I, I think that's really cool. Um, I'm not personally crazy about, I don't even know how to put it. This is just pure opinion. This is not... Mm -hmm me attempting to be some sort of objective critique here. But he, he has kind of a, a cartoonish quality to his his faces yes. and his uh, mostly his faces, no, I think. Absolutely. Sometimes his mannerisms. And it's very expressive and I think it works great. Um, I personally am not enamored by mm -hmm. it, but but that's not to say that he's not doing amazing work. It's just I understand. Uh, you know, it's not my, my favorite. I, I see I really like that style um, <laughs> there's there's I'm, I I can't I'm not an expert on comic book art I'm not gonna speak like I am well I am gonna speak like I am but just know that I don't really know what I'm talking about but <laughs> you know I just yeah, exactly here. Eisner comes from that time when that was like the the style the style of art there's there's a technical level of pro there's a level of proficiency to like the technical aspects of the art like all mm -hmm. the all the backgrounds are rendered incredibly realistically you know there's there's humongous attention to detail but then the figures have uh, you know a slight personalized cartooning to the way spe specifically like you mentioned with the faces which allows them mm -hmm. to be expressive and that mm -hmm. to me that creates this unique world that can only exist in comics mm -hmm. because um, I mean I, I mean it's, I suppose it can it can exist in animation too. That's that's the I guess that's what I'm getting at is that's the difference that's the that's a strength in mm -hmm. in uh, art versus uh, film or whatnot is because mm -hmm. you can create this world where you have control over like what you're trying to depict literally and what you're trying to depict figuratively. Right, and it's. I mean, it's the same thing that you see in a lot of, uh, like, Japanese manga comics, where, mm -hmm. like, the technical proficiency of, like, all of these all these science fiction spaceships or city streets or right. motorcycles, it's like they just got a, a, you know, a book, like a technical manual, and it's just illustrating... Right. It's, like, it's like engineers design them. Yeah, it's like, like engineers design them. And then, and, and then they have the most, like, empty styled character faces with just big eyes and a line for a mouth and sometimes not even a nose. Right. You know, and there's this weird like contrast of, you know, the the figures which they don't even try to like they won't even try to follow anatomy for the figures. They got long legs and but like everything else is so technically accurate. And that I that I do think that kind of springs out of this uh, golden age of cartooning, specifically back when a lot of people were doing comic strips. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um uh, I, wow, I can't think of any of the names that I was trying to think of. Um, <laughs> the guy that did Flash Gordon. Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna it's, help it's you. It's okay. Sorry. I'm I'm gonna not blather on about this if I don't know the names because I don't want to sound like an idiot. <laughs> but uh, Alex Raymond, that's the guy that I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. Alex Raymond is also like another like grandfather of comics. Like he he his style like. Had a, had a great style 
And again, mm-hmm. it's that's it's the same thing that Eisner's doing, where it's very technically proficient everywhere, but he still allows himself to uh, basically do cartooning on the faces, which mm-hmm. which gives it a unique look. And it's a look that's okay. not necessarily in vogue right now, uh, particularly with superhero comics, where everybody's obsessed with everything looking photorealistic. And so mm-hmm. people want people want the the technical accuracy but then they also want photorealistic faces fit inside that world and that right. bothers me i feel like that's just kind of bland like i'll watch a movie for that i i like i right. like well it doesn't it doesn't take full uh, advantage of the media that's what i'm getting at yeah basically yeah uh, yeah i yeah i could as i'm as i'm thinking about this now like his faces are extremely expressive the the fact that they are all over the place in terms of kind of there's this cartoonishness like the faces tell stories yes. um, and that in itself is is a pretty powerful aspect to comics I mean, if you're going to draw talking heads <laughs> right exactly <laughs> really how to make those heads uh, you know get the point <laughs> across yeah exactly yeah. I also think yeah. he does um, there's also this uh Something that's really nice about Will Eisner that I think, I mean, I don't want to say Will Eisner is the only one who does this, but, you know, a good comic book artist, but it's certainly present in this book, is that all of his characters all look unique. It doesn't, there's mm-hmm. not, there's very few, like, repeat faces. Like, you can always mm-hmm. tell, what you can always tell, like, when a char- which character a character is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I think... Yeah. For the for the most part, I think that's most prevalent in the second story, a life force, because that's the only one where you really kind of spend time with a lot of the characters. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, like a lot of times in in a lot of the uh, monthly comics, you know, where production is you know higher and you got to crank out pages. This, I mean, this kind of goes back to like my criticism of Jack Kirby. A lot of his like he a lot of the women all had the same face. Like, they just all looked... Right. They just had a different hairstyle, which was usually one of, like, four hairstyles. Right. And right. then right. and then a, a different color. And that's how... Different costume, exactly. different color, yeah. And, I mean, that right. was that was the demands of what he was doing. And it, it worked for mm-hmm. what he was doing. But, but mm-hmm. there's so much more detail into the character designs in something like mm-hmm. uh, Will Eisner's book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally, totally see that. And I just googled Alex Raymond, and his stuff's really impressive. Oh yeah, so Cla- also a good recommendation. Yeah, classic Golden Age comic book artist. <laughs> yeah, he's really, really good. Um, yeah. Ah, so I think I don't know. Uh, any final thoughts on Will Eisner's A Contract with God trilogy? I think we covered the big ones. I. This particular book, The Contract with God Trilogy, um, is a great introduction to Will Eisner. And like we were saying, the three stories, you can kind of see um, a clear progression of his artistic intent and how his work kind of weaves together. Um, and I would strongly recommend it. So Yes, I, I w- would out. agree entirely with what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, thank you, Alex, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Th- thanks, everybody, and anybody out there who's listening. Uh, in case you forgot, my name is Aaron Walter. You can find uh, me on Facebook. You can also find me on Twitter at AA Walter. On Twitter, AA a. Walter. And uh, you can read. Uh, my comic that I am currently writing uh, it's called The Birdlander you can find it at www.thebirdlander.com and it's a comic illustrated by my good friend Ed Bickford and we are currently, we're just about to start issue 3 it's, it's planned as a 5 issue series so we're right in the middle of it but it's all available to read online so check it out please if you get around to it and you can also find other stuff that I have written at newhavencomics.com and you can find new episodes of this very podcast at comicdna.podbean.com. And uh, Alex, I think you still got that portfolio website up? Yeah, it's yeah. up, but not, nothing yeah. new to look no, at there. No new work? Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I'll uh, 
I'll keep you posted when it's up. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening, and we will. Oh wait, I want to try out my new my new catchphrase. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you in the funny pages. <laughs> 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 All right. All right.